So I want to thank you all for being here, those of you who are in person, as well as those, as well as those who are on Zoom. Specifically, I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Carolyn Gordon, Valerie Gordon's sister, as well as Catherine Jones, Valerie Gordon's aunt, as well as Christian Lamar, who has joined us today, a classmate. <laughs> Me and father of our son. So you are joining us here today for the 28th annual Bentley Gordon Human Rights Lecture co-hosted by the Program on Human Rights and the Global Economy, Furby, and the Black Law Students Association, BALSA. Today we are also celebrating the 15th anniversary of the Fergie Fellowship Program. <laughs> So this lecture typically features outstanding lawyers, judges, scholars, and advocates who share their experiences in advancing human rights. So I'm excited and happy to formally welcome you to this event. And now I'll ask the Dean of the Law School, Dean Hackney, to come and give us some welcoming remarks. Great, thanks. So, uh... I like the time. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, welcome to the 28th annual Valerie Gordon Human Rights Lecture. <laughs> An applause. That's just, that's just, that's just great. Um, a special welcome to Valerie's uh, family, who, in keeping with 28 years of tradition, are joining us uh, today. We are thrilled to have Kristen Lamar, one of my favorite people in the world, um, who is Valerie's husband, here with us in person uh, today. Uh, other family members, I believe Valerie's sister, Carolyn and aunt are on the Zoom, maybe? Yeah. Uh, so welcome to all the family members. So the annual Valerie Gordon Human Rights Lecture celebrates the memory of the late Valerie Gordon, class of 1993. Valerie was a fierce advocate in human rights, uh, advocate and valued member of uh, our community. Uh, and as someone who was here when Valerie uh, was with us uh, at the law school, and was one of her professors. She was very much a force of nature, had an incredibly warm smile, and uh, sorely missed. Prior to her time at the law school, Valerie was a journalist, an affordable anti-racism and women's rights uh, activist. During her time at the law school, she was an active and committed member of the Kemet chapter of the Black Law Students Association. Valerie was also a co-founder of the Students of Color Coalition, advocating for, I don't know why this is coming in and out. Is there another mic here? Sorry. It's going to be ready to closer. Okay, great, thanks. That was great. Oh, up a little closer. Is that good? Okay, thanks. Uh, Valerie was also a co founder of the Students of Color Coalition, advocating for increased student diversity and end to institutional racism and attention to race, culture, and difference in the law school. Curriculum. Valerie married Kristen Lamar, another class of 1933, a student. After, okay. After their graduation, Valerie and Kristen moved to Albany, Georgia to begin their legal careers. And shortly thereafter, Valerie tragically lost her life to a sudden illness. Because of Valerie's enormous impact here at our law school and beyond, 
Law School's chapter of the Black Law Students Association sponsors an annual human rights essay contest named in her honor for first year law students. The author of the winning essay receives the Spirit of Valerie Gordon Book Award. I am very pleased to announce that the winner of this year's award is Mylynn Clement. In honor of Valerie Gordon, the law school gathers here today um, to hear an excerpt of the winning essay and a keynote lecture from a distinguished human rights activist or scholar. This year, in addition to honoring the important legacy of Valerie Gordon, we are also celebrating the 15th anniversary of the Fergie Fellowship Program. This important program provides funding support for outstanding Northeastern law students doing unpaid human rights co-ops. Given the dual purpose of today's event, we found no more perfect keynote speaker than Alexandra Tarzakhan. Alex is a graduate of this law school, a former recipient of the Fergie Fellowship, and an accomplished human rights activist. More will be said about Alex later. She is working as a legal advisor at the American Bar Association Center for Human Rights, though she will be speaking in her personal capacity uh, today. So when you get out there in the employment world, you'll see that the word dual hats and have all kinds of caveats, uh, et cetera. Um, but it's all good. We'll be hearing from Alex. Uh, we are honored to have her deliver the lecture today. But now I'll ask uh, Landy to come back. Let me take over the platform. Thank you for your remarks, Dean Hackney. As you all have heard, this is an event in honor of such a rich history here at Northeastern and specifically for the Kemet chapter of Bolsa. So I'm just here in presentation of our essay winner, Marlene Clement. And so I wanted to tell you all a little bit about what the annual essay contest is about. So the annual essay topic is typically focused on current legal events that impact African-American lawyers and law students. And this year, our prompt focused on the public health of the Black community during the COVID-19 pandemic. The essay evaluates the legal mechanisms available to influence health inequities within the Black community. And the pandemic was just one example on a macro scale of the health disparities that Black people face across America. So join me in welcoming my Lynn to the stage. Good afternoon, everyone. I will be reading an excerpt of my essay, Sex Trafficking in Black Communities as a Result of the COVID-19 Pandemic. During the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, Sienna was a 14-year-old middle schooler in Miami-Dade, Florida. She was homeschooled in Miss Dockney out with her friends, like any other middle schooler. So she turned to online chat rooms to find friends on the internet. And while online, Sienna was able to talk to a variety of different people, posting as people on television. And she finally felt included. She finally felt safe and accepted during a dark time when other adolescents her age was not feeling as secure. So however, through her online interaction, she started to realize something. Something was wrong. And she found herself within the sex trafficking trade. Sienna was later brave enough to reach out to police assistance to hold her trafficker, trafficker accountable. In January 2020, the COVID-19 virus spread to the United States, leading to a pandemic. Due to the limited social interaction and physical restrictions implemented, there were more economic pressures on working families. Black communities 
vulnerability were exasperated by already limited access to resources. COVID-19 increased unemployment, poverty, homelessness, and communities became increasingly vulnerable to sex trafficking due to economic hardship. Many trafficked children who encountered the legal system through foster care were also victims of abuse and were also classified as delinquents as a result to academic challenges. Despite efforts to combat human trafficking, the federal government has not been so successful in reaching out to individuals of color. The desired outcomes of prosecuting traffickers, defending survivors, and eliminating human trafficking are undermined by systemic racism. By dehumanizing Black people, results for the historical biases towards hypersexualizing Black women and girls. There are stereotypes of who is a trafficker and who qualifies for victim protection services. For example, in 2020, Lieutenant John Caruso of the New Jersey Crimes Against Children Task Force stated, sex trafficking does not get the attention because people don't want to talk about it. And people don't realize that everyone thinks that the predator is the guy who's 50 years old and driving a white van selling ice cream. The federal government needs to investigate beyond the stereotypical description of a trafficker so that providers and law enforcement can be trained to identify victims and their users. Legislature should provide additional resources to combat sex trafficking within communities at risk. A task force to address domestic child trafficking would be imperative to research the best methods of our outreach and prevention. After examining methods of prevention, it would be important to train health and social service providers about sexual exploitation against Black women and their children and community. This initiative should include law enforcement and teachers. This solution would bring more awareness and recognition of the signs associated with sex trafficking. It is also vital for service workers to respond appropriately to the needs of their client populations. Both Black women and children should feel like they can approach law enforcement and that they can find themselves in situations that are appropriate and that they are supported within their communities. So more education is required so survivors and people can feel supported by their elected officials. There should be steps in bringing awareness through legislation and to provide and prevent information about online and in-person sex trafficking. And by gaining the Black community's trust, members may perceive that the legal system can be reasonable and fair. With students, there needs to be an empathy to create spaces where they do not feel like there were punitive measures for being trafficked. Teachers should be well equipped to employ tactics to combat implicit bias that affects Black students disproportionately within the educational system. Restorative justice initiatives in schools increase diversity within the classroom and enhance academic results. It is crucial to promote safe environments so that survivors can come forward and be able to identify their traffickers and so that they can be prevented from harming others. If Sienna's community in Miami Dade impl implemented additional resources towards programming to address sex trafficking, it is possible that she could have felt more comfortable approaching law enforcement quicker than she had previously done. Having a sex trafficking task force within Miami could have identified specific chat rooms that were common among the children and adolescents within the area. Programming would have been useful to members of her community and where they could have noticed the possible signs of Sienna becoming reclusive and anxious. She mentions that she was afraid of the stigmatization surrounding sex trafficking in her community. Addressing the fear of retaliation from law enforcement and discriminating among her peers would have supported Sienna from making the decisions to notify the police officials of the online trafficking activity. She hoped that community members and officials may strive towards assisting people rather than criminalizing survivors. Today, Sienna works alongside the Miami-Dade Police Department to advocate for survivors and educate people. Thank you so much.
My name is Elizabeth Ennin. I work as the Director of the Program on Human Rights in the Global Economy, known by its initials, PHRGE or PERGI. And I, it's my pleasure to welcome you all here today on behalf of PERGI. I'd also like to say a huge thank you to Balsa for co-hosting this with us. It has been a real joy working with Lanji and Melissa on this program. And I'm always impressed every year at the mobilization of the entire ball to make this event happen. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. <laughs> I would like to echo the happy special welcome to the members of the Valerie Gordon family. Um, here on Zoom, we have the Reverend Dr. Carolyn Gordon and Catherine Jones, welcome. And of course, as you can tell, a very beloved member of this community, Christian Lamar, who's home from Atlanta to be with us here today. Thank you so, so very much. And I think my brother-in-law, Larry Gordon, is also welcome. Oh, welcome, Larry. I'd also like to offer a special welcome to Alex Tarzikan, a distinguished alum I met a few years back when she applied for a Fergie Fellowship. Speaking of the Fergie Fellowship, as you have heard, it is our 15th anniversary this year. It's an extremely important program. As Dean Hackney mentioned, it provides funding for unpaid human rights co-ops. Since its founding, the Fergie Fellowship Program has uh, supported over 200 co-ops in 14 different countries, 17 US states, and Washington, DC. Doing an unpaid co-op, particularly an international unpaid co-op, can be a real hardship for Northeastern students. So we are extremely proud of the source of funding for unpaid co-ops and we're proud of the program. A couple of years ago, we started calling the recipients of this program, we switched from Fergie Fellow to Fergie Scholar. And I know that there are Fergie Fellows and Fergie Scholars with us on Zoom. And I know there are Fergie Fellows and Fergie Scholars here in the room. And a special welcome to all of you. Thank you for helping us celebrate our anniversary. Speaking of recipients of the Fergie Fellowship, I turn now to the happy topic of Alex Tarzakan delivering our, our lecture today. I met Alex in 2017. One day that summer, her application for a Fergie Fellowship came across my desk. It stopped me in my tracks. I was humbled by the accomplishments of this woman. She had already done so much by the time she was a second year law student here. It surprises me not one bit that she has continued to do extraordinary things. And a few short years after graduation, made an appropriate speaker for our keynote lecturer of the Valerie Gordon uh, lecture. So thank you so much. Alex grew up in Syria in 2011. She came to Boston to pursue an undergraduate degree at Northeastern University. It was her plan to go to medical school. But as many of you know, 2011 was near the beginning of the Syrian war. And from her state perch in Boston, she watched the war escalate. She watched a terrific refugee crisis unfold. Millions of people were affected and she determined to do something about it. And she has done so, so much. I'll mention just a couple of things here quickly. She switched from going after a degree in medicine to a joint degree that she thought would put her in the best possible position to promote the human rights of Syrian refugees and other marginalized communities. So she combined a JD from this fine law school with a master in public health from Tufts. She has in turn volunteered at work at refugee camps in Greece, Jordan, and Lebanon. And while in Boston, she helped resettle uh, Syrian refugees here. After her earning her joint degrees, she spent two years at Northwestern Pritzker School of Law, serving as the Schwett Clinical Fellow in Health and Human Rights. And during that time, she supported health and human rights projects in many countries, including Somalia, Lebanon, Ghana, the, the Dominican Republic, Bangladesh, and Gaza. This past fall, I'm delighted to report that she found the perfect job, and they're so lucky to have you, at the American Bar Association Center Human Rights, where she serves as a legal advisor for Southwest Asia and North Africa. She will, however, be speaking in her personal capacity here today. When we sat down to try to find the perfect speaker who could weave together our two themes today, the Valerie Gordon legacy and human rights on one hand, and human rights and the Fergie Fellowship Program on the other, we very quickly landed with our hearing aid Alex. And we are thrilled that you accepted our invitation, thrilled that you are able to join us, and it is my honor and pleasure to introduce Alex, who will deliver her lecture Hello. from Fergie Fellow to international human rights expert, 
Lessons for Building a Career in Human Rights. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, um, it's so great to be back at NUSOL um, and to see a lot of familiar faces. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking Elizabeth for the very kind introduction, for inviting me to be the keynote speaker for this year, to Dean Hagney, um, to members of Valerie Gordon's family, um, to faculty and students and everyone who's tuning in remotely. Uh, and thank you also as well to, to Balsa and to Fergie for putting together this event. Um, it's an honor really to be delivering this year's uh, Valerie Gordon Human Rights Lecture, which was named after the late Valerie Gordon, um, a brave journalist who shed light on uh, racism and the injustices faced by her community, a trailblazer who wasn't afraid of challenging the status quo, and a dedicated human rights champion in the US and abroad. And so today I'll be walking you through my career path journey, um, which wasn't necessarily that straightforward, um, and describing how uh, I got into the field of international human rights. Um, I hope that by sharing my story, I can inspire others to pursue this field um, and offer insights and reflections throughout. So as, um, uh, Elizabeth mentioned my career path wasn't, you know, that wasn't from point A to point B. Um, there are a lot of twists and turns kind of in between. Um, but I think a common theme that um, was present was a deep desire to want to uh, focus on just social justice um, and really try and affect change within uh, Syrian refugee populations. Um, because I felt I had a responsibility to, to give back. Um, so I wasn't really sure at the time um, when I first got to law school how I was going to achieve that, but I'll be describing um, some things that helped, helped me um, along the way. So, um, so just a bit more background. Uh, I was born in the US, but I grew up in Aleppo, Syria. I speak uh, four languages, in addition to Arabic, uh, Spanish, and, and French. Uh, during law school, I worked in France, Greece, Lebanon, and Jordan. And during my fellowship at Northwestern, I traveled to Belgium, I traveled to Botswana, Lebanon, uh, Nigeria, the Dominican Republic, and attended the Climate Change Conference in Glasgow. Um, I'm based currently now in DC and I work as a legal advisor at the ABA Center for Human Rights, uh, mostly focused on the Southwest Asia and North Africa region, which used to be called the MENA region. Um, and my focus areas include international human rights, global health, humanitarian operations, international humanitarian law, migration, and climate change. And so how did this all begin? Um, so I left Aleppo in 2011, right at the start of the war. And initially when I got to my undergraduate degree, I thought that I wanted to pursue medicine. Um, but then I quickly realized after doing my first co-op um, at Mass General Hospital and Mass Ioneer in the audiology department, that that wasn't the setting that I wanted to be in. Um, I enjoyed the, the experience. You know, at some point I felt like I was in Grey's Anatomy, but I didn't really, really consider uh, or really see myself uh, determined and, and really focused in, in um, you know, pursuing the medical medical studies. Um, I was more, I knew I was interested in health, but maybe not necessarily in that way. Um, and so following the co-op opportunity, I took a class um, which was specific to my discipline. So it was health writing in the, as a, um, it was write, a writing class in the health disciplines. And um, the purpose of the class was to also reflect on the co-op opportunity and uh, focus on a research topic. And that was in 2013 when the war in Aleppo really started to escalate and became real to me that I'm probably not going to be able to go back uh, to Syria. And so um, I chose to focus on healthcare del delivery in war zones because I wanted to understand if there are any safeguards in place for medical personnel who are providing uh, care in conflict zones why aren't um, humanitarian actors being considered a neutral party in the conflict? And that was really my first exposure to law. Um, and I was really drawn to this field. And it was really thanks to Dr. Laurie Edwards, 
who um, you know sat with me and brainstormed on potential uh, pivots that I could see. And she was really the one who informed me about the joint uh, law and master's of public degree. And uh, so then I ended up taking a pre-law minor. I enjoyed, I really enjoyed the coursework. And for the second um, internship, I ended up working at the University of Miami's Health Rights Clinic. I landed on that position because um, when I first learned about the joint degree, I wanted to understand what were some potential career paths that one could pursue with this joint degree. And it was relatively new at the time. And so I just went on LinkedIn, tried to find someone with these degrees and uh, came across um, a, third, a three L law student at UM, University of Miami. And I just, you know, asked her if I could do an informational interview. And then we started talking. She's like, well, if you have this uh, summer, you can come and, and work for us at the Health Rights Clinic. And that was an incre incredible opportunity because we got to work with um, different populations, uh, including asylum seekers, undocumented uh, immigrants. And I really got exposed to the healthcare access issues that people were facing uh, due to their immigration status. And so by, um, we had a client who was undocumented, needed dialysis treatment, but because of his immigration status was getting denied the care that he needed. And there was a law called the Emergency Medical Treatment Act uh, that requires hospitals to provide care if it's deemed life-threatening, but dialysis wasn't part of this law. Um, and so it was a fascinating, a fascinating experience to be able to work on a legal case using medical evidence to prove why dialysis should be part of um, this law and ultimately um, be able to provide this person with the treatment that he needed. So the doctors were always there. The treatment was always available. The missing piece was this access component that was tied to someone's immigration status. And I found that fascinating. So essentially you're getting to the goal of saving someone's life, which was what drew me really to, to medical school, but you're doing it through a policy change, advocacy and uh, legal reform. And so, um, so yeah, so I ended up going to law school and I pursued the joint degree. And um, throughout, you know, I, I, I'll discuss a little bit uh, about the different experiences that I pursued. I'll talk about the TEDx Tufts opportunity that I had. Um, I'll share about my dear friend Sada's story and how I got involved in a um, campaign to free humanitarians that were being criminalized for their humanitarian work in Greece. Um, I'll talk about the fellowship a bit and my current role, um, and then also provide some, some advice kind of based off of my own uh, reflections. And so uh, during law school, uh, for those who don't know, uh, there was a refugee crisis that was um, escalating at the shorelines of, of Europe. And so a lot of uh, refugees starting at the end of 2015, 2016, started to cross on makeshift dinghy boats um, to try and seek safety in order to get to Europe. So a lot of them were crossing from, from Turkey to get to Lesbos, which was considered a gateway island to get to Europe. Um, and there were thousands of thousands of refugees who were crossing initially at the beginning of, of uh, this crisis. Um, and I remember, you know, seeing a lot of headlines in the media, and um, I just felt a sense of responsibility to want to go and see the situation for myself, because I was, at the end of the day, someone who had a U.S. passport, um, and had been privileged to not have to face the same legal barriers as, as um, refugees have to face. And I remember, um, when I went to Lesbos, uh, there was a site called the Light Jacket Graveyard, which is filled with thousands and thousands of colorful light jackets um, that represent all the lives lost uh, in the Mediterranean Sea. And these light jackets uh, were actually made out of styrofoam, a material that can't actually save someone's life. Um, and there was one, I remember there was a striking one that's here in the middle. Uh, it was a child, child, children's like a floaty device. And it said a warning to not be used uh, under shallow waters. And so these um, life jackets were really given to people who are trying to cross the Mediterranean Ocean. Um, although in reality, they wouldn't be able to save anyone's life. Um, and so I just want to include that background um, for you know, what really inspired me to want to go to and see this situation in the first place. 
So throughout law school, when I first joined, uh, I was a co-director of uh, the International Refugee Assistance Project. It's the Northeastern chapter for the for IRA. Um, we supported in you know in collaboration with pro bono lawyers uh, different asylum cases. We did know your rights trainings, um, and so I knew kind of from the start that I wanted to try and find different opportunities in law school to build up my resume. Um, I think you know it's important to start when you come as a one L. You know you don't have to have it all figured figured out, but it's important to try and. Um, Think about how you can best leverage your time here because it does go by really quickly. And one hour year, you know, you know, it is already gone because you're, you're too focused on your introductory courses and required courses that you have to take. But there are other opportunities that you can pursue throughout, whether it's meeting with faculty. I remember when I first joined, you know, I wanted to identify who were the people that I would want to, I wanted to do research with or learn about, you know, their, their work and how they got into the field. What were some other extracurricular or volunteer opportunities that I can get, be engaged in um, throughout that would allow me to build kind of my, my career and my resume portfolio? And so that was one of them. Um, and then I remember towards the kind of after I finished the, the first fall semester, um, I started to reach out to different alum to figure out, you know, if someone was into, interested in the field of international human rights. What were some of the things that they did themselves because they're the people that know best since they you know at the end of the day had also gone through these similar experiences and i remember i reached out to sara gojed um which was a jd mpa i think it was an mpa um, graduate from france and she had founded a grassroots organization called yes academia in paris and I reached out to her, you know, it was supposed to just be an informational interview. And I told her, uh, I'm starting to think about my first year uh, co-op opportunity. And uh, we started talking and she was like, well, you know, if, if you want, um, you speak French, you, you can come and, and work with us um, for the, the summer. And, um, and that's kind of how I landed that first co-op opportunity. It was just, you know, showing interest, reaching out and having a conversation. Because at the end of the day, you know, you never know um, what that can turn into. And for me, it turned into my first co-op opportunity. Um, and yeah, that was that was uh, really rewarding. We worked with different marginalized youth uh, through empowerment programs, uh, also supported with some uh, NGO kind of law uh, requirements because it was transitioning. They were trying to transition their name. So I got exposure to that type of work as well. Um, and then throughout law school, I, uh, I had gotten connected with someone who was focused on migration flows in Europe, uh, Professor Dennis Sullivan, and I reached out to him. He's part of the uh, Boston Consortium for Arab Region Studies at the under, undergraduate school. And we started talking and I told them uh, that I would be, I would have like a week in between the end of my co-op and um, when I have to come back to to pursue my, my second year. And we started talking and he was like, well, if you're interested, I'd love for you to come to Greece and help us with this research study that we're trying to work on to better understand migration flows and understand how the EU-Turkey agreement is impacting um, the flow of, of refugees and migrants throughout Europe. And so I ended up you know, partaking in that research study. I went to different uh, sites, to Athens, Athens, Lesbos, and Thessaloniki. We conducted in-depth interviews, um, you know, qualitative interviews. We did some ethnography. It was very dense um, in that one, one week, um, but it was an incredible learning opportunity. We got some training on um, you know, how to interview people who um, may be experiencing second, may be experiencing PTSD. Uh, how do you, how do you interview vulnerable populations? Because that's definitely a, a different skill set that you learn. You know, it's not your usual client. Um, and those are things that I, you know, kept on using to again build up my my resume. Um, and then while I was pursuing the MPH degree at Tufts, I ended up um, going to Lesbos because I had uh, a two week break between the end of the MPH and when I had to uh, come back to the, the law, law school. 
And I worked for the Emergency Rescue Center International uh, in Lesbos, which uh, was focused on search and rescue operations. So we were rescuing people who were arriving at the shorelines of, of Lesbos. Um, and you know that was a very emotionally intense uh, experience. And I wasn't necessarily prepared for you know secondary trauma. I was I was never really trained on it. And I'll describe a little bit um, you know what are the some of the coping strategies that I ended up uh, using. Um, and then uh, lastly, you know the Fergie Fellowship uh, with the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society in Lesbos. Uh, after I, having seen you know the public health conditions, after having worked on research, I really wanted to try an opportunity to find. Um, ways to engage with the legal system and get a better understanding of the legal framework in Greece. And so it was really thanks to the Fergie Fellowship that provided me with the funding to be able to go and, and pursue this opportunity. Um, it, was, it was, again, really rewarding uh, because it allowed me to really see how I can serve as a bridge for Syrians on one side, but then also as someone who was now, you know, aware of the legal processes um, and someone who was already in law school, I was really able to advocate uh, for their rights. And there's one story that I'm going to share, which is the story of a Fadi, who was someone that I was interviewing, we're just doing a client intake to assess whether or not he had a, a legal claim. And um, Fadi, I, re I remember when I was speaking to him in Arabic, had uh, difficulty hearing. And so, you know, I, I remember I was really raising my voice and I started to ask, you know, do you have a hearing issue? Is this something that you were born with? Or, you know, was it as a result of the war? And he then um, informed me that there was a bomb that had exploded um, next to his house and a scrap of the bomb had injured his ear and then um, led to that hearing defect. And, um, and so I decided to, to see if we can get some um, evidence of it medically uh, to be able to build a case as to why this person would be considered a vulnerable group because of his medical um, disability. And so, you know, in, in Greece and in the asylum system, being a refugee isn't enough. Because there were so many refugees that were crossing, they started to impose you know, more restrictions and it became really limited those who were able to be able to see uh, safety. And um, so we got a, an audiogram and I knew how to read it because I had done that um, pre-med um, co-op in the audiology department initially as an undergrad. So it's crazy how it all came full circle. Um, but we were able to build his case, again, using medical evidence to prove why this person um, you know, should be considered for legal status. And now Fadi is actually in Germany. Um, and he was able to resettle with, with the rest of his family. I always get kind of, uh, I always get goosebumps when I hear about the story uh, because yeah, it's crazy again how like this all kind of uh, came around. Um, and then turning to my dear friend Sada. So Sada, uh, I don't know if how many of you have heard of the documentary called The Swimmers on Netflix. Um, just a show of hands, I'm just curious to see. Okay, so there are definitely a few that have watched it. Um, so this uh, was this documentary highlights the story of, of two Syrian sisters, Sara and Yusra Martini, uh, who had crossed the Mediterranean to seek safety. They're also Syrian, um, and they were trained swimmers back in uh, in Syria. And um, 15 minutes into the journey on their dinghy boat, the engine of the boat stopped working. And so they ended up jumping into the water and swimming for three hours and a half, rescuing the 18 others that were with them on the boat. Um, and I met Sara and became really good friends with her and Lesbos because we were the only two you know, Syrians at the time that had gone to volunteer in, in the setting. Most of the volunteers were Europeans. Um, and you know, even that experience alone was incredible because you know, I felt at the end of the day, I had a responsibility to give back because I was from Syria. I spoke the same language, we had the same ties. But at the end, you know, there was nothing really that was forcing these other volunteers to go. And for me, that was really true humanity to see people just working tirelessly day and night to put a smile on, on someone's face, which was incredible. Um, and so, so then I ended up, um, I'm just going to minimize this because I think there are a few people that have their videos maybe on. Um, yeah. The little bit, yeah. 
there we go. Um, and so, so yeah, so then I, um, I became really good friends with Sara and I felt, you know, there, there has to be a way to really amplify her voice, uh, because I remember one thing that struck me when we met is that she had also wanted to pursue a law degree. And she said, you know, um, you could have, you're the person that I could have been if the war hadn't started. And, um, and I realized, you know, I, that, that meant I had a privilege. I had a privilege because I had, again, a U.S. passport that allowed me to um, be able to pursue these opportunities. And also, I remember there were a lot of women, um, mothers coming up to me and being like, well, you know, we hope our, our daughters can become like you one day. And, you know, as heartwarming as that felt, I knew that the reality, um, you know, it was going to be very difficult for them to also be able to pursue similar careers because of all the other legal barriers that um, people were facing. Um, and so what do you do, you know, when you leave a place like Lesbos and come back to your comfort zone, when you're there really in the field, you don't really have time to process, um, you know, mostly think about some of the stories that you're hearing, the experiences you're facing, because you're kind of in flight or flight mode. Um, and so when you come back uh, to your home and you have all this time, your mind really starts to wander to a lot of these places. And I wasn't necessarily trained on secondary trauma, um, but I remember, you know, when I came back, I felt this enormous amount of guilt because, you know, here I go again, I can just get up and leave while a lot of the refugees that I had met who were so resilient, um, you know, had to remain stuck in these horrific refugee camps. And it was really as if you had pressed the pause button on their lives. Because I remember the first time, between the first time that I had gone and the second time, I was able to, um, you know, accomplish so much in that one year, whereas they just remained trapped. Um, and there were, you know, enormous uh, backlogs that, uh, that were, you know, in the, in the immigration system. And so this could take, you know, years and years uh, to be able to resolve their, their um, legal claims. And I remember that I had seen um, a call for proposals and the theme was, where does your mind wander? And initially I thought that I had to uh, write a proposal based off of this theme. Turns out that wasn't the case, but it actually worked out my advantage because this um, allowed me to kind of reflect on the best ways to uh, highlight some of the stories that I had seen. And I ended up focusing um, my proposal on side a story and, you know, contrasting the different differences between us while highlighting a lot of the similarities um, and using her story to really humanize what it meant to be a refugee um, and also discuss, you know, uh, some of the other stories that, uh, of, of the people that I had met um, and my own personal story. And, um, you know, I remember when I gave this talk, I, it felt as if I had lifted a huge weight off my shoulders, because that was really the first time that I had first sat down and reflected on a lot of these stories, but then also voiced it out um, and shared it with a larger audience. And I remember around this time was when Trump was elected and there was a lot of negative rhetoric, um, you know, around immigration, around refugees. And... Uh, that then led me to create a social media platform for, called Meet a Refugee um, in order, you know, again, to humanize refugees and uh, share, it, share it with a wider audience. And so I, I still um, use that platform and it's allowed me to be able to go to different talks and give a lot of these same, you know, presentations um, uh, as well. Um, and so then after that, um, I think this was towards like the near end, maybe one of the last, uh, my last semester, I still hadn't pursued a clinic and I knew that I really wanted to. And I ended up enrolling in the IP collab, which I believe now is called just the international uh, intellectual property, property uh, clinic. And um, I was intrigued by it because, you know, in my head, I knew that at some point I'd love to be able to start my own you know, nonprofit organization. I'd love to be able to kind of figure out uh, how can I trademark a logo or copyright the, the name of the organization. And so that's why I, I pursued that clinic opportunity. And it was amazing because we got to choose who our clients were if we wanted, if we wished. And I cho chose um, this organization called ADIP um, and supported them 
during the, their copyright and trademarking process for both their logo and their name. And ADIF was an organization that created coats and these coats transformed into tents. And for every coat that you purchased, there was one that was donated to um, a refugee in need. And so, so there are definitely ways, this is just to show that there are ways that you can kind of create your own path, um, even if it may not seem as straightforward. You just need to find you know, the right opportunities um, and think really creatively as to how you can really tailor a lot of the, your time at, at law school. Um, and so then after I um, had graduated, I, I think I had my last um, public health co-op to, to finish. This was sometime in August 2018. And I had a week off and I decided to go back to Lesbos just to catch up with Sara um, because she had already you know, given two years of her life to give back uh, to refugees in, in Lesbos. Um, and so we were, this trip was just meant, you know, a catch up trip before her return back to Germany, which she has. And when I was there, um, the, you know, she checked in to her flight to go back to Germany and the Greek authorities come and arrest her. And I was there when it happened and I went into full kind of lawyer mode because I couldn't understand, you know, why is my friend getting arrested? Um, you know, what were the, the basis of these charges? And this then ended up developing into um, a criminal case against um, three you know, main volunteers. And there are a host of other volunteers who are also charged, but they focused to target mostly on Asada, Sean, and Nasus. And they charged them with egregious uh, charges, including human trafficking, espionage, um, the, the illegal facilitation of third country nationals, and really spin this into a criminal case towards the criminalization, really what I like to call criminalization of solidarity. So essentially, you know, making it difficult for people who want to help uh, those in need from being able to do this type of work. And um, that's kind of how I got involved with, you know, the Free Humanitarians campaign. It was really an ad hoc effort of um, other volunteers who had gone to work in, in Lesbos coming together to think about how we can really, um, you know, raise awareness, how can we um, get them, get the charges, you know, um, dropped. And um, we really had to create, uh, think creatively. And so I'll, I'll just share uh, this clip here that kind of summarizes some of the efforts that we ended up um, doing. So we went with members of parliament in, in Europe, um, and ultimately, Sada was put in prison for around, I think it was 106 or 103 days, almost three months, um, in pretrial detention. And, and I went and saw the conditions. And even though this was in Greece, the conditions were horrific. At some point, she was even put in solitary confinement, just for giving a blanket and water to people who were crossing um, and getting to, to Lesbos. Um, and so we ended up, I remember there was, um, there was an exhibit that was featuring Sada's story at the uh, Museum, of, Museum of Fine Arts and um, Julianne Moore and Alec Baldwin, when you first enter the exhibit, they're just narrating uh, different stories of refugees. So that's the first kind of exhibit that you enter. And then the second room uh, shows you the portraits of the people that they're supposed to be um, portraying. And one of them was Sada. And so I knew that um, initially Julianne Moore uh, was going, and Alec Baldwin were both going to be here in Boston for uh, the opening of this exhibit. And so I was like, well, you know, Julianne Moore has a big following. Can we see if there's a way that she can post about it um, and, you know, just give a few words or if maybe the, the art curator can describe it. And so I ended up reaching out to the art curator and I told her about the case and I asked her, you know, if, if you could just give like five minutes of your presentation to uh, just highlight the case. Um, and she did. And I got to meet with Julianne Moore and Julianne Moore posted about it on her social media page. Um, and it generated a lot of traction. And so I'm just saying this because, again, you know, this is not your typical kind of advocacy work, but it definitely requires some creativity because it, I think initially one of the main barriers that we faced um was the fact that people because these were so egregious people couldn't necessarily believe or wrap their heads around what was really happening in europe you know again this is not 
the Middle East. This was in Europe. Um, and so I think that, uh, you know, that definitely helped. Uh, and then Sada was awarded a disobedience award at MIT. Um, she was still put in, she was still in pre-child detention at the time. So I went and accepted the award on her behalf. Um, and then a few days later, she was released. So fast forward, um, the, the charges, the misdemeanor charges have, uh, were dropped in January. Unfortunately, they still haven't dropped the felony charges, so there's still a long way to go. Um, and I encourage everyone to follow the free humanitarian movement on social media, um, because unfortunately the fight is not over. Um, there are a lot of cases like these. There was even a few, a handful of cases here in the US, um, in Arizona, I believe. There was someone who had provided an asylum seeker with water and then was fined. Um, so this, you know, is not an isolated case. Uh, it's really um, an effort to create fear and try to deter, deter refugees from making these crossings in the first place. Um, and then following that experience and after graduating, I, um, I knew that I, I wanted to try and find a fellowship opportunity within an academic setting because I felt like a lot of my experiences had been focused on um, migration issues, forced displacement, but I wanted to understand the international human rights framework more broadly and maybe get a sense of other contexts so that I could then learn, you know, maybe what can work in one context and we then replicate it somewhere else. Um, and so I ended up applying to um, the Shwedi Clinical Fellowship in Health and Human Rights at Northwestern. I actually found out about it through uh, Newsol's Career Advising Services. So I definitely recommend if you haven't done so already, it's <laughs> Career Advisors because that way they can, you know, if they see an opportunity that, um, you know, might be of interest, they can keep you in mind and share it your way. Um, that's definitely what happened to me in my case. And I remember, I think the deadline was like, I had one week to submit my application. I was like, wow, this is this definitely seems like the perfect fit because again, it's combining human rights and, and health. Um, and yeah, I ended up working there for three years. It was supposed to be just a one year fellowship with general funding. Funding got renewed and then pandemic hit and I wasn't getting the same you know, experience that I had been getting when I first started. And so I had asked my supervisor if I can extend it for a third year. So, you know, definitely try and be persistent and show your interest because that, that definitely worked to my advantage. Um, I'll just highlight three projects. Um, first, the Access to Health Project in Nigeria. Um, and then we had another one in Lebanon and then a collaboration that we did with the Clooney Foundation for Justice. So in Nigeria, there had been health, a needs health, health assessment that had been conducted uh, before I, I joined, and that revealed uh, low health literacy rates. And my supervisor was really interested in trying to figure out different ways that we can try and change this, um, whether it was through the legal framework or other public health methodologies. And we ended up um, developing an iterative uh, health community-based education you know, curriculum. Uh, that was tailored to the different topics of interest of the community. And I got to go to Nigeria, which that was part of my orientation. I traveled there, I think maybe three weeks into the job um, to go and implement this curriculum. And also um, at the time they, there was a collaboration with a consulting firm um, that was helping us develop an app for the curriculum. So the purpose of the trip was to go and field test the app and figure out, you know, is this the technology that the community is going to be able to use? Um, and how can we use this data that we're collecting to then try and hold uh, the governments accountable? Because a lot of the times there, uh, health clinics were supposed to be open. You travel <laughs> three hours to get there, but the, to then find out that the clinic is closed and there's no way to really um, you know, ensure that the clinic is going to reopen or hold those people accountable. Um, and so we got to go there and you know, it was an incredible opportunity to work alongside the community, um, really focused on a bottom-up approach where you just provide kind of legal empowerment um, techniques to then have the communities themselves be drivers of, of the social change that, that they wanna see. Um, I then worked in uh, Lebanon this, um, I had previously been in touch with this organization called Besmen Zetune uh, that works predominantly in the Shatila settlement and then expanded to other sites in, in Lebanon. 
And um, it was great to be able to be back in touch with the organization and create this, this project that was looking at um, how can we transform an existing program that they have had into a social enterprise so that they can generate some revenue from some of the good that they were um, creating for the women and then um, you know, use that to then uh, support uh, the women's livelihoods. And so that uh, had to, you know, that, that trip then led to you know, discussions with different um, parliamentarians doing uh, assessments into what were the legal frameworks in Lebanon to register as a nonprofit organization, to register as a social enterprise, um, and it was a really great rewarding opportunity. And then lastly, the, the Clooney Foundation for Justice. I remember this came up um, in my interview for the physician. They had just asked if I was familiar with, with Trial Watch, which is an organization um, that's part of uh, the Clooney Foundation where they uh, send different legal observers to go monitor court proceedings to ensure that fair trial rights are being um, you know, uh, held. And I remember that they had been one of the organizations I had contacted uh, to go and monitor Sada's case if, um, you know, what, and when that, that time was going to happen. So that was also another kind of full circle point for me. Um, and then even now at the ABA, um, you know, we have a trial watch um, program as well. And so this is also just to say that, you know, networking is really key and this is a small circle at the end of the day where everyone's kind of connected in, in some, some way or, or shape. So it's just important to go and, and reach out uh, to a lot of organizations and not just apply to internships just because you might have you know, heard about them or you think that they're prestigious. I think it's important to kind of look, um, at least for me, what, what helped is kind of looking at um, some of the people that I was interested in their careers and kind of working backwards and seeing what are the positions that led them to those uh, opportunities. And so currently now at the ABA, I focus on um, supporting human rights defenders who are facing persecution or prosecution for their work, um, whether that's journalists, other lawyers, judges, um, and you know, other human rights activists. Uh, we look into issues of arbitrary detention, uh, enforced experiences, and digital surveillance, same a few. Um, we'll be drafting different uh, Global Magnitsky sanctions submissions, um, and then also submitting reports to various UN special procedures. Um, I'm personally really interested in environmental defenders in the region. Uh, I know that this has been a topic that has been covered in Latin America and other parts, but not necessarily in the Swana slash Mina region. So um, I look forward to carrying out some of that research. And then also, again, with Trial Watch, um, we have that collaboration and uh, we find that really when you send a legal observer to monitor these cases and have international eyes, um, there's more of a likelihood that you know, things might go right. Um, you know, you might not get to the final outcome that you're hoping for, but at least there's some attention um, on these different proceedings. And so just lastly, just to um, end with just some general advice, I think, you know, first step is really get out of your comfort zone and be open to new challenges. Um, you just never know where different opportunities can take you. Um, for me, that, you know, stepping out of my comfort zone was really, really going into to Greece, you know, and going to Lesbos, um, to a context that I wasn't necessarily really familiar with. Um, use your internships really to build on different skill sets, kind of, you know, take the time now to look at different job descriptions, create an Excel spreadsheet um, where you see, you know, these are the required qualifications um, and where do you fall and kind of, you know, start and pile up your resume that way. Uh, network and do a lot of informational interviews. You know, I did a lot. Um, and the worst that can happen is that someone says no. And most of the time people like to talk about themselves. So they're probably not going to say no. So just like <laughs> go for it. Um, I think diversifying your experiences is, is also important um, so that you can get a sense of different contexts and, and um, you know, different environments and figure out um, where it is that, that you really see yourself. Having mentors also is, is key, whether it's professors or other, you know, previous supervisors, 
but developing those relationships to have someone to be really your cheerleader and sounding board um, to me, I'm, I'm tremendously grateful to, to all my mentors that I met along the way. Um, be persistent and show interest. And at the end, you know, never underestimate yourself. You came to law school, you got in for a reason. So just own it. And um, yeah, just, um, you know, I hope that uh, I end up seeing many of you on, on the other side of, um, of this journey. Thank you so much for that inspiring talk. So now we'll be opening up the floor for questions or comments. Alex has shared a lot with us. So I know that we have a lot of things. Oh, Could you talk a little bit about um, funding and so on? Because I, you know, it's really kind of ask for advice about these international co-ops. The hardest thing is, you know, how they can't afford it. Um, and so I'm just wondering, what would you say to students? Would you recommend that people take on non-paying volunteer, you know, jobs just to get the foot in the door? Or is there another strategy that you could recommend? No, definitely. I mean, I think for me, uh, the Fergie Fellowship definitely supported me uh, to be able to go and do that you know, three-month uh, legal fellowship that I did in, in Lesbos. Um, the other opportunities were more short term, so you know they didn't really require a lot of funding because oftentimes when you sign up as a volunteer, the accommodations are you know included. So most your most of your expenses are going to be the meals and the airfare. Um, and in Lesbos, it, it was relatively you know cheap uh, compared to the other U.S. for like meals and things like that. Um, but there are also a lot of um, funding opportunities that you can seek. Uh, there are some funding opportunities that you can seek through the American, um, I think it's Amer American Society of International Law, ASIL. Um, if you aren't aware of that you know, professional membership, uh, definitely look into that. Um, and there are a lot of times, a lot of different calls for you know, grants that you can apply to as a student as well. Um, you know, if anyone's interested in kind of sitting through and, and through that, I'd be more than happy to to kind of discuss different opportunities um, that I I came across. We have time for one more question or comment. What about the legal empowerment aspect of that work? I I like that phrase and centering the community in that work. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, so there's uh. A movement, I would say, kind of in the international human rights framework to try and just essentially be um, vehicles to then like equip the societies themselves to be able to make these, these changes that they want to see. Because it's really the societies that know their communities best. Um, and so it's thinking about, you know, for example, we had uh, that example that I provided about the clinics being shut. We then um, filed a Freedom for Information Act request to try and get um, you know, other information from the clinics to see how we can ensure that they can remain open. Or looking at, um, like a lot of times we would hear from community, communities going to the clinics and then um, being asked to pay for vaccines, even though the vaccine could be free of charge. And so we filed this uh, Freedom for Information Act to be able to get that information and then equipped the societies with the information themselves to be like, no, you actually have the right to tell someone that, no, I'm not, I'm not supposed to pay for this service uh, because it should be free. And so the missing piece here was this, you know, access to information. So how can you provide the communities with that information that's required to allow them to then, you know, speak up for their rights um, and get, you know, the, the care that they, they need. So that's kind of one example that um, comes to mind and I'm happy to share um, more resources about that because there's a whole kind of um, uh, ideology behind it as well. If you have more questions for Alex, we will be having a reception around the corner. So mm -hmm. hold your questions until then and now I'll be calling up some questions to present. Hello. 
Hello, Alex. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for attending today. This truly does mean a lot to both Fergie and the Black Law Students Association. And thank you in particular to you, Alex. Your story has been very inspiring from your upbringing to your time at Northeastern with co-ops around the world and your work now. And on behalf of both Fergie and the Black Law Students Association, we would like to present you with this speaker gift. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, I don't know about you, but I am so impressed by the work that we have heard today from my Lynn, as well as from Alex. So thank you so much. Let's give them all another Thank you so much. And now I'd like to welcome Christian Lamar to the stage for some closing comments. And just to give you a little bit of background, Mr. Lamar was Valerie Gordon's classmate as well as husband. He has worked for the public defender since 1994 and specializes in representing indigent capital defenders at the pretrial and trial level. He currently serves as the deputy director of litigation of the Georgia Capital Defender. He is a member of the faculty at the National Criminal Defense College, and he is a veteran of the U.S. Army, which he had served for 6.5 years. So please welcome me and join us. Um, thank you all. Thank you all so much uh, for keeping Dollar's legacy alive. Works with you and Alex is uh, uh, overwhelming. But Dr. Gordon, <laughs> Dr. Gordon, you want to listen to me? You want to say something? I can hear you. Uh, uh, good afternoon to everyone. And uh, of course, it was always good seeing you uh, to Dean Hackney and to uh, the faculty staff there and just all of you who are striving to be who you've been called to be in the world. We uh, just thank you, Alex. Thank you so much for your lecture today. It just reminds us again that, you know what, as we live our lives along the way of pursuing, uh, that's how we impact and make a difference on the world. Uh, I think about my sister and just honored that you honor her, but uh, if you be the best you can be, then you have lived up to her expectation of life. She, uh, law school changed her life, of course, because she met Christian there, but um, <laughs> also because of, <laughs> it, uh, it taught her, remind her uh, the gift of being a voice for the voiceless. And even now, if you have watched the news, and I'm a trained journalist, so if you've watched the news, lawyers are in the forefront for uh, forefront of everything that's going on right now. And I'll let you decide what I'm talking about. But I just challenge you to, to do you in this world and be that difference and change that can happen. Uh, I appreciate each of you, and I'm gonna turn it back over to Christian. I do wanna acknowledge my Aunt Catherine, who is also virtually, uh, I'm in Mississippi, Ms. Aunt Catherine's in Mississippi. My brother, Larry, uh, is also in attendance here, uh, Valerie's brother, who's in Kansas City. And so we, again, just thank you, acknowledge you, and we confer on Christian the responsibility of speaking for us all. So thanks so, again, and hopefully uh, I'll be there with you in person next year. <laughs> I just said we both trying to get to class, right? And yeah. um, just want to thank everyone I see familiar faces, Margaret, uh, Lucy, Dean Hackney, of course. Uh, I saw familiar faces on the uh, Zoom, uh, Brooke, um, and other folks who I might have missed. Thank you again. Uh, Northeastern is a family. NUSL is a family. Uh, we bring a family member back in Alex to, to spread her knowledge. And um, one of the things that hit me in looking at uh, with um, my Lynn and also with Alex and also with Valerie, her activism, you know, I mean, I was a dude from the South and 
I was like this fierce black woman <laughs> who was like, yeah, we'll get married, but I'm keep my name. Okay. <laughs> Um, and what's and also like Carol said, um, so much is going on now. And even though as a woman, as a woman of color, in terms of the things that are going on, I mean, this whole thing with, with Angel Reese and uh, this is always again the challenge, right? To be who you are under these and society trying to tell you who you should be or what you should not be. And you know. Valerie was fierce, just like you guys are. And uh, I just wanted to try to tie that back to the to that time and also understanding that she taught me. Uh, and I hopefully I'm a better human being because of it. Um, and over the past 30 years, you know, this friendship, I hope Alex, 30 years from now, you'll be coming back because I'm here. Uh, believe it or not. Chris Alabrani O'Connor, I was her teaching. I was her teacher. <laughs> she's class of 95, so give her a hand. She's here. Uh, the family that is uh, Northeastern is so beautiful. It gives me uh, joy to come back. I get renewal because, you know, the work I do is, is quite stressful and quite um, challenging. And so I call that the desert. And this is the oasis, right? That you come back and you get the view. And so I hope that you guys will see that in the future. Thank you, Dean Hackney, for continuing this. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Balsa. Thank you, Furby. Thanks to you, everybody. See you again next year. <laughs> Did you all have a great time? Yeah. Great. So in the spirit of things, thank you all for joining us, for joining Fergie, for honoring Valerie Borden, for joining Volta. Um, for the ending of the ceremony, we will be having a reception that will be near Docs 250, so you can join us for dessert and coffee. Um, we do need to exit the room a little bit because we know there is another time. But thank you so much for being here with us. Um, and we'll see you over at the reception.